Today, it finally began. After all these years of talking and nothing but talking, we have finally taken our first action. We are at war with the system, and it is no longer a war of words. I cannot sleep, so I will try writing down some of the thoughts which are flying through my head. I am so jittery I can barely sit still, and I'm exhausted. I've been up since 5.30 this morning when George phoned to warn that the arrests had begun. How long we will be able to continue defying the system, no one knows. Maybe it will all end tomorrow, but we must not think about that. Now that we have begun, we must continue with the plan we have been developing so carefully ever since the raids two years ago. I'll never forget that terrible day. They knocked on my door at five in the morning. Four Negroes came pushing into the apartment before I could stop them. The one with the bat shoved me back into a corner and stood guard over me while the other three began ransacking my apartment. Then the one who was guarding me flashed some kind of card. After the three who were conducting the search had looked in all the obvious places, they began slitting open my mattress and the sofa cushions. About that time, there was a commotion out in the hallway. Another man walked into my apartment. The blacks greeted him deferentially and reported the negative result of their search. Tepper ran his finger along the list of names and apartment numbers on his clipboard until he came to mind. He frowned. I was handcuffed without further ado and led outside. I still remember the Washington Post headline the next day. Quote, fascist racist conspiracy smashed, unquote. But not even the brainwashed American public could fully accept the idea that nearly a million of their fellow citizens had been engaged in a secret armed conspiracy. Anyway, the whole thing soon became so embarrassing and so unwieldy that most of the arrestees were turned loose again within a week. But the police did get mug shots, fingerprints, and personal data from everyone. When we were released, we were told that we were still technically under arrest and could expect to be picked up again for prosecution at any time. Discouraged and uncertain as we were, though, we began laying new plans for the future. Oh, my God, it's 4 a.m. Got to get some sleep. When the others were finally able to wake me up yesterday, we put our heads together to figure what to do. The first thing we all agreed was to arm ourselves and then to find a better hideout. Money is our main problem now. Two days ago when the word came that they were starting the arrests again, we had no chance to withdraw money from the bank. So we have only the cash that was in our pockets at the time. We finally decided to go out and take some money. Henry looks at everything in terms of our ideology. He convinced me that if we're going to rob liquor stores, we have to do it in a socially conscious way. We parked about a block and a half from Berman's around the corner. A black was at the cash register tending the store. Far from this arbor of 
It's impossible to know what will happen, but it's certain that I'll never be able to go back to the quiet, orderly kind of life I had before. Maybe the change of scenery tomorrow will improve my outlook. Henry and I will be driving to Pennsylvania for our guns, while George and Catherine will try to find us a more suitable place to live. Tomorrow will be a long, hard day. It was a little before noon yesterday when we reached the turnoff near Belfont and left the highway. We drove as close to our cache as we could but the old mining road we had used three years earlier was blocked and impassable more than a mile short of the point where we intended to park. The bank above the road had collapsed, and it would have taken a bulldozer to clear the way. The consequence was that we had nearly a two-mile hike each way instead of less than half a mile, and it took three round trips to get everything to the car. The day was pleasantly cool, the autumn woods were beautiful, and the old dirt road, though heavily overgrown, provided easy walking most of the way. Even digging down to the top of the oil drum, actually a 50-gallon chemical drum with a removable lid, in which we had sealed our weapons, wasn't too bad. We still had to carry more than 300 pounds of munitions half a mile through the dense woods, uphill to the road, and then more than a mile back to the car. We had to stop every hundred yards or so and put our loads down for a minute, and the last two trips were made in total darkness. On the way back to Washington, we stopped at a small roadside cafe near Hagerstown for sandwiches and coffee. There were about a dozen people in the place, and the 11 o'clock news was just beginning on the TV set behind the counter when we walked in. It was a news broadcast I'll never forget. The big story of the day was what the organization had been up to in Chicago. The system, it seems, had killed one of our people, and in turn we had killed three of theirs and then engaged in a spectacular and successful gunfight with the authorities.
When we arrived, George and Catherine were as excited as Henry and I. The new place is much better in every way except the rent. We have a whole building to ourselves. Legally, the owner of this building isn't supposed to rent it, but he evidently has an arrangement with someone in City Hall. The advantage for us is that there is no official record of the occupancy of the building. No social security numbers for the police, no county building inspectors or fire marshals coming around to check. impulsively held out my arms to Catherine. Hesitantly, she stepped toward me. Nature took her course. Today, I completed the detonating mechanism for the bomb we'll use against the FBI building. If we're lucky, that will be the end of government's new $3 billion computer complex for their internal passport system. Despite the failure of Unit 8 to find as much explosives as we want, we are going ahead with the operation. The final decision on this came late this afternoon in a conference at Unit 8's headquarters. Henry and I were both there as well as a staff officer from Revolutionary Command. I was asked to attend because I am responsible for the proper functioning of the bomb. Henry was there because he will be delivering it. Slow down, leave in sun. Don't get everything that needs done. Woe is me. Why can't I see? I'd best be leaving well enough for me. The neon lighting ones couldn't stay out of class. Keep a heart with me in memory. Well, there's one in every crowd for crying out loud. Why was it always turning out to be me? Where does it go? Good Lord, only oh, know. Seems like it was just the other day I was down at Green Gables A hawking them tables And gently blowing all my hard-earned pay Piano rolls blue Danced holes in my shoes There weren't another other way to be For lovable losers so be it. Tomorrow night, we'll know a lot more than we do today. Sorry, sorry. Oh, so sorry. Hey.
the Hunter Diaries. Money is our main problem now. We finally decided to go out and take some money. The system, it seems, had killed one of our people. And in turn, we had killed three of theirs and then engaged in a spectacular and successful gunfight with the authorities. Hesitantly, she stepped toward me. Nature took her course. The FBI headquarters. Our unit has been assigned the task of blowing it up. According to the latest estimate released, approximately 700 persons were killed in the blast or subsequently died in the wreckage. That includes an estimated 150 persons who were in the sub-basement at the time of the explosion and whose bodies have not been recovered. It may be more than two weeks before enough rubble has been cleared away to allow full access to that level of the building, according to the TV news reporter. That report and others we've heard yesterday and today make it virtually certain that the new computer banks in the sub-basement have either been totally destroyed or very badly damaged. All day yesterday and most of the day, we watched the TV coverage of rescue crews bringing the dead and injured out of the building. It is a heavy burden of responsibility for us to bear, since most of the victims of our bomb were only pawns who were no more committed to the sick philosophy or the racially destructive goals of the system than we are. We have gone over this before, and we are all completely convinced that what we did is justified, but it is still very hard to see our own people suffering so intensely because of our acts. It is because Americans have for so many years been unwilling to make unpleasant decisions that we are forced to make decisions now which are stern indeed. Yes, the inability to face reality and make difficult decisions that is the salient symptom of the liberal disease. Nevertheless, every time the TV camera focuses on the pitiful, mutilated corpse of some poor girl, or even an FBI agent being pulled from the wreckage, my stomach becomes tied in knots and I cannot breathe. It is a terrible, terrible task we have before us. One day we will have a truly American press in this country, but a lot of editors' throats will have to be cut first. I'm back with my old friends in Unit 2. These words are being written by lantern light in the place they fixed up in the loft of their barn for Catherine and me. A bit chilly and primitive, but at least we have complete privacy. This is the first time we've had a whole night together by ourselves. Actually, we didn't come up here for a romp in the hay, but to pick up a load of munitions. The fellows from Unit 8 who were sent up here last week to find explosives for the FBI job were at least partly successful.
This morning is my first chance to write since Catherine and I picked up the munitions in Maryland last week. Our unit has carried out three missions in the last six days. Altogether, the organization is held responsible for more than 200 separate incidents in different parts of the country, according to news reports. We are really into the thick of a guerrilla war now.